Hello, it's great to be here. It takes some getting used to not being able to see anybody, but um, I wanted to thank John Schusler and everybody from MUFON for putting on this great conference and for inviting me to speak at it. Um, I just wanted to tell you, first of all, that um, I'm going to cover two things in, this, in the brief time that we have, so I'm going to go fairly quickly through a lot of material, and then I want to have time for questions at the end. Um, the first part is I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on my, my journey as a journalist publishing on UFOs. And then we're going to talk about the work with the Coalition for Freedom of Information that I've been doing and the Kecksburg, the effort to obtain documentation on Kecksburg, which has resulted in a lawsuit against NASA. And so I want to just start by telling you that I'm not a UFO researcher. I am a journalist, and they're very different. Um, I've been you know, able to benefit tremendously, of course, from the researchers. And all the people that are here today have been of great help to me in doing the job that I have to do as a journalist which is primarily to get the information out in the press, to make the information available to people that have a right to it. And, to, and my personal mission has been to try to get through the ridicule barrier that we all are so familiar with. Another goal, which a lot of journalists have, um, myself included, is to try to change policy through articles. And I've done that for years on various other issues. I, I, I worked for many years on the issue of human rights in the country of Burma. I was sort of a specialist in Burma. I wrote a book on it, published articles, which did lead to you know, hearings and, and changes in policy. And that's always a goal. Um, to let you know that my background involves uh, uh, publishing freelance articles in lots of mainstream media and also working for a public radio station in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, KPFA Radio, where I co-hosted and co-produced a daily investigative news show for many years. Um, so um, you might want to know, why would somebody like that get interested in UFOs? And um, I'll start by telling you that, and we'll, we'll go to the first slide. Um, back in the summer of 1999, um, a report was sent to me by a colleague in France, France called the Cometa Report. Many of you may be familiar with that. Um, but this was a, an extraordinary 90-page study that was put together by a group of generals and admirals, uh, the equivalent of the head of NASA in France, uh, the, the chief of police in France, um, uh, scientists, weapons engineers. Um, it was extremely high level because it, it involved people of very high stature in France, although it was not a government document. It was a white paper, as they call it. But um, on, in the slide, you can see the... Um, the four-star general, General, Nor yeah, general Norlane is the, the one on the top, who's the four-star general, who's one of the motivating forces behind the study. On the bottom is General Letty, who's an Air Force pilot, very well known in France. And General Norlane is a um, counselor to the prime minister. So there were a lot of connections to the government. In any case, what was extraordinary about the study was that these individuals spent uh, three years studying only official documentation from around the world on the UFO subject. And um, they, they drew a very extraordinary conclusion uh, in the end of the study. You can see it up here on the, uh, the part that's highlighted. Um, they basically stated that the best uh, conclusion to explain UFOs was the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And as I said, this was based on a lot of study of a lot of documentation of interviews with pilots, of studying radar, radar visual cases, speaking with governments around the world. Um, and they did realize that 5% of sightings are really the only valid ones. Most sightings can be dismissed. But they were focusing their study only on those in which there was enough documentation to determine that they were not something uh, man-made. And they described this, this 5% of objects. They said that they seem to be completely unknown flying machines with exceptional performances that are guided by a natural or artificial intelligence. And you know, we may have all heard things like this before, but what was significant about this was the caliber of the people that wrote this and the numbers of people that wrote this. And as a journalist, you can't turn away from uh, that quality of, of um, you know, instigator. Of the, the, when you consider who wrote this report, it is a journalist's responsibility to take it seriously. And um, I did that. And I believed it was newsworthy that people of that stature would come forward and draw a conclusion like this and make that publicly available. Um, the other thing that was really interesting about this report was that they called for international action and asked the European Union to get involved in uh, addressing this issue and particularly address the issue of, of US secrecy, which they considered to be a major problem. Um, so I wrote a story about this for the Boston Globe. 
And it's a long, I don't have the time to tell you the saga that I went through in trying to get this story published. But I did appeal to about a dozen uh, papers. I mean, I appealed to more, but many of them were ones that I had published in before, papers who respected my work and all, usually you know, ran the, the story. It took, the only reason I was able to get it into the Boston Globe was because I had worked with the editor there on about five other stories in the past, and she happened to be very open-minded um, and liked my work. But it, it was really touch and go. And the only reason for that was because of the subject matter. It didn't matter who the voices were behind the report. It didn't matter that, that I, I applied the same standards of journalism to this article that I've applied to everything else that I've published. It, what mattered was that it dealt with this taboo subject. And I was able to learn through direct experience just how serious the problem uh, is of ridicule. Um, because most of the publications would not even look at the story. And some of them hung up on me. And I tried to even avoid using the word UFO, even though the title of the report was UFOs and Defense. What are we prepared for? And just as an aside, the report is very focused on the national security implications of UFOs, because it's basically a military document. But nonetheless, none of that really mattered. Um, but I, I was very, you know, I didn't even know until two days before this came out whether it would come out at all. And it took three months for me to a back and forth with the editor, and twice in which she said, forget it, I can't handle this, it's too sensitive, I'm not going to do it. And it was a long process, and I can answer any questions about it later. But um, it was a breakthrough for me to get it published. I was very, very um, inspired to do it. I felt it was really important. And um, I was just fanatical about getting it published and very happy that it, it worked out. Um, and I'm gonna, in a minute, we're going to talk a little more about the ridicule factor. But I wanted to just uh, share with you another story I did a year later. The Globe story came out in 2000. And this is a second story that came out in 2001, which originally appeared in the Providence Journal, which is the paper of Providence, Rhode Island. It went out on the wire service and was released all over the place, including Canada. And this dealt with um, the issue of aviation safety as it relates to UFOs. And this is the kind of information that a journalist can work with. You have to have something. This was, this was based on a report by Richard Haynes, who I know many of you are familiar with. Um, and he's an aerospace scientist from NASA Ames. He'd been there for years. Um, had been collecting case reports from pilots, only from pilots for about 30 years. He released a study in which he analyzed those cases in which aviation safety was affected and documented about 100 cases in which aviation safety was affected. In other words, pilots had to make sudden maneuvers to avoid collisions. Planes were pulled off course by, by the objects. Um, imp, you know, the instruments were affected. Compasses went crazy. People were the, the crew was distracted by things going on outside the window. And he believed that this was of serious concern and the aviation community should take it seriously. And that's the kind of, kind of sort of official document that allowed me to do another story and to branch off into other aspects of the question of, of pilots as, as they report UFOs. Um, and I just, I, I, there was one case that I found to be so fascinating that I mentioned in this article that I just wanted to share with you very briefly. Phil Schultz was a TWA pilot who had been flying for decades. He was 54 years old. He was flying over uh, Michigan in 1981. And he, this man never believed in UFOs. And he had had, um, he was formerly a Navy pilot in the Korean War, had had vast experience in many hours flying. This is a drawing that he made of an object that he witnessed from the cockpit. And uh, Richard Haynes helped him draw this. They were actually in the cockpit when they drew it, and they drew it to scale. And you can see that the object came in. You know, he, he saw this round object, and it came in, and it tilted and flew away. But what was very extraordinary about this was that he was so close to it and that he was able to see windows. And I just wanted to show you his handwritten report, um, which uh, first just describes the, uh, this is just sort of a description. I'm not going to use this thing. I've, I was told back there that if I pressed the wrong button on this, the whole system would collapse. And there's one little button with a white sticker that I'm supposed to press to use the pointer. I'm afraid to do it. So, um, You can see in his little description, though, he describes that this object came in, and he describes it as a round metallic object. I want to show you a couple things, though, that I really find fascinating in this slide. Um, he, uh, I wonder if I wrote this down someplace. 
Okay, he, what's really interesting here is that he, is, is that he describes the object, um, first of all, he's very clear that it's solid. You might be able to see that, but secondly, that it is the size of a grapefruit held at arm's length. If you hold a grapefruit out like that, that's close, that's a big object. And it gives you a sense of how, what a good look he got at this object. Um, I lost it in my, in my, can you put it back in the TV screen here? Thank you. Um, and he says, checks below that, the size of a grapefruit, are you sure? And then he says, yes, very sure. Uh, um, this is another thing that I really find. fascinating when they say um, what is some, they're asking him to describe the characteristics of the object and what in what he saw the third section down he did, he says um, he saw something that he called a bending of the atmosphere and you know for an airline pilot to say he saw the a bending of the atmosphere I mean we have to all think about what does that mean what does that look like you know it sounds like something out of some kind of contemporary physics that we're just beginning to understand he saw something that he described that way, and I think that's really fascinating. When he was asked later, what did you think it was? He said, a spaceship. He could think of no other possible explanation for this object. And um, it's interesting that other pilots have used the word spaceship. They tend to not say UFO. But they're clear that it's a spaceship. So that's, that's just an example of the caliber of report that, that Haynes has collected and that I was able to write about in this other story. Um, but to get back to the, I want to touch a little bit on the ridicule factor. We all know a lot about it. But one thing that I wanted to share with you was uh, something called the Robertson panel. I don't know how many people are familiar with that. But um, the other night, the panel was talking about what might be some of the roots of ridicule and when did it all start and how did it all start. And um, I think it's very important that in 1953, the CIA convened a panel of scientists. They were actually handpicked by the CIA in which they were told to study the UFO question and to come up with conclusions about how to manage all the reports that were coming in. The, the phone, the, the communication systems were getting clogged up. And people, the Air Force was concerned that this might become a national security problem. There were too many reports, too much focus on it. We need to do something about that. They brought these scientists together and told them, to, they gave them four days to study all the information on UFOs, which of course is not nearly enough time. Um, and, um, so the conclusion that they came up with here as a way of managing the people's interest in the subject was um, through training and debunking. You can see where it's highlighted there. Um, and it says in the, in, the, in the report that the goal of the report was to reduce public interest in order to prevent the filing of reports. That's the quote. That was the purpose of it. And it, it, the report recommended that the national security agencies take immediate steps to strip the unidentified flying objects of the special status they have been given and the aura of mystery they have unfortunately acquired. And, um, and the, the, what they proposed to do that, this is, the, they actually used the word debunking in black and white. And they proposed using the media to do that. In other words, uh, uh, you know, well, I like the second line here, which isn't underlined. This education could be accomplished by mass media such as television, motion pictures, and popular articles. And they go on in the report to say, we'll use, we'll use Walt Disney, we'll ask Arthur Godfrey to help us, we'll make training, we'll make, we'll make cartoons, we'll make training videos, we'll go to colleges, universities, et cetera, et cetera. And they have all these plans about how to control the media. They also suggest that, that all civilian groups be infiltrated by intelligence groups that are providing information to the public about UFOs. So basically, this document, which was kept secret until the mid-'70s when it was released through the Freedom of Information Act, nobody knew that this, this panel existed and that they drew these conclusions. It basically was giving license to the intelligence community, all the intelligence agencies of the US government, to, to, to infiltrate both the media and the research groups in order to get the message out, which was to shut down the UFO problem and debunk the issue. And um, I'm sure, I believe that this played a major role in uh, the media's, you know, how the media became so focused on ridicule and debunking. There was a letter that was unearthed years later that two panel members, one wrote to another one in 1966 in which he said, um, I've been able to influence a CBS program based on the conclusions of the Robertson panel. So we have in black and white that these conclusions were put into effect. Um, 
I wanted to just, I, I just think that's an important element of ridicule that many people may not know about. This is just sort of a, a list of various factors that affect ridicule, and most of them you all are very familiar with. I wanted to focus in on something that I've called the wink factor, um, which is something I've come up against a lot as a journalist. And um, it deals with the issue of a, a, a paper might maybe being able to, they might be willing to run a story, but they have to make sure that you know that they know it's a stupid subject. They have to somehow get that message in there. As long as you know that we're not being fooled and we take this seriously, we'll run the story. And I had an opportunity to talk to Ray Suarez about this problem, because this is a major problem. He's the senior correspondent for the PBS News Hour with Jim Lehrer, which is a news show on public television. I don't know how many of you watch that, but he's an accomplished journalist. And he moderated a panel of scientists, which I helped organize at George Washington University in, in, in uh, Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago. So I had an opportunity to talk to him about the problem of ridicule in the media. And he's the one that brought up this issue of the wink factor. When I asked him, what do you think is behind the ridicule problem? And um, I'm going to read you to what he said, because I think he said it very well. The news business tends to be wall-eyed. It has one eye on the story and one eye on the potential public reaction to the story. So if you're working in an atmosphere where you anticipate that this is going to be met with inc incredulity and ridicule, you pull your own punch. You don't want to write about it as if it's serious and then have people make fun of you after the fact. You want to pre-bake in that notion that perhaps the whole thing is ridiculous. In effect, wink at the viewing or reading audience to show that you're on to yourself. Yes, I'm telling this news story, but wink at the audience to say, I know that we're not supposed to take this seriously. Will that change? I don't know. I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. I wanted to show you just a couple examples of that. Remember the story I showed you from the Providence Journal? Some um, earlier about the pilots. It's just a clean story with a straight headline. You know, the government's new study shows such and such. That was put out in the wires. When a story goes out, the, art, the author has no control over how it's presented. This is just an example of, what, of the wink factor here. It's a serious story, but look at the drawing they, they have to put on the top. And then the headline is also kind of stupid. Um, another, other examples of that, this is another story that I did. I don't know if it's hard to read here, but a very serious headline, Ashcroft's FOIA policy deepens government secrecy on UFOs. And this, this was a piece that talked all about um, Freedom of Information Act issues and some of the work we're trying to do in Washington to change that situation. This also went out on the wire service. So I think it was the Knight Ritter. And you know, here's another, this is another newspaper. Um, look at the picture that goes with it. This, this, I guess, represents some kind of an abduction of a businessman or something. There's all these UF, four of them up there. Um, the guy's, you know, fallen over and he's about to be pulled up into a spaceship. What that has to do with Freedom of Information Act, I have no idea, but anything to do with UFOs generates this kind of stuff. And they just, they're not comfortable running the story without it. This one was the one that upset me the most. Um, you know, that face, I mean, uh, that is the kind of thing I try to stay away from at all costs, and I don't have control over the media. So I think um, it's important for us to recognize when we see a story that even though it looks like that, that may not be you know, really representative of what the story's saying. Um, the other issue I wanted to just touch on, which is a very um, you know, difficult thing to talk about, and we've, we've talked about it a little bit at this uh, at this press conference, at this, we talked about it at the press conference the other day, um, is the role that the UFO community plays in, and I, you know, by UFO community, that's a very broad term, but let's just say that there are people, there are true believers, there are people that call themselves experts, there are people that don't analyze data and don't really have a sense of what information is appropriate to present to the press and what isn't. And there's nobody overseeing that process, unfortunately. So um, I just sort of, as a journalist myself, knowing what information I can use and also knowing what other papers can use as they've responded to me as a journalist, um, I just think that some of these points are important, that you know, we cannot present exaggerated information, we cannot present inaccurate information. We cannot present theories that we may believe but are sort of couched as if they're truth. I mean, you have to present the simple facts along the lines of what John Chusers talked the other day. You can't go too far with the media or they're going to dismiss the subject. Um, and, you know, facts have to be able to be documented. This is the rule of being a journalist. You can't publish things that aren't documented. 
and they have to have corroboration. They need more than one source if, you, if you're relying on a source, and the sources have to be very credible. Um, telling the mainstream media that extraterrestrials are here, that they're on the planet, even that word is hard for media to handle, but especially when you make the statement as if it's fact, they are here. Any number of us are convinced that that is the case, but that's not the issue. The issue is what is the media going to be able to respond to? What is going to motivate them to look into this? And what is going to get them to write stories? That kind of a statement will not do it. It has the opposite effect. Um, could you put this back up? Yeah, and then um, the last one, you know, you have to be very careful of the language you use. We made all be angry at the US government because there's a cover up and there's this and that. If, I have found that accusing the government of misdeeds is not effective. What we really want are results here. If you're too accusatory, they're just going to back off. The media doesn't like to, to come on to the government like that for all kinds of reasons. And um, what was the last one there? And then jumping the gun is another issue. I mean, this is all, we could spend a whole hour just talking about each one of these points. But um, you have to be very careful not to present them with facts, even if they're facts, but with material that they're not ready for. You have to realize you're dealing with people that know nothing about the subject when you're dealing with the media. So you have to give the very basic factual information. You don't want to go too far. And that's where the abduction issue is a very difficult one. And most reporters just are not equipped to handle that. It doesn't mean it shouldn't be covered. It doesn't mean it's not valid. But um, you know, you got to kind of start them at the kindergarten level, unfortunately. Um, so those are just some of the things I've learned. I want to I want to shift now into the Kecksburg case, um, and after having gone through this experience for a couple of years in dealing with journalism, um, I became part of a group called the Coalition for Freedom of Information, which I helped found in the fall of 2002. Um, and um, I just uh, okay, I want to get rid of some of this stuff here. Um, and this, this group had, um, the goals of this group are, and still are, to increase scientific credibility for this subject, to get uh, achieve congressional interest and action in it, to provide serious media coverage, and to encourage the media to provide serious coverage, and to do case investigations which revolve around the Freedom of Information Act. Um, in the fall of October 2002, we decided to focus our efforts around the case of the Kecksburg and I just want to shift this. The, this is a picture of the, the sort of this team we have. Um, it's an incredible team. It consists of a law firm, a very well-established law firm in Washington, D.C. The Sci-Fi Channel, which is the, our backing, the Sci-Fi Channel has provided the funds for all of this to happen. A public relations firm, which is um, called... Desta Mattoon, and um, Stan Gordon, who is over there on the far right of the screen, uh, who he has been working on this case for 30 years. One of the reasons we selected this case was because of the work that Stan Gordon has done. I'm sure many of you know Stan. Um, and so all the work on the case, all the investigations, all the data had been collected. The witnesses had been interviewed. So we didn't have to do any of that. Um, and Stan is a superb investigator. So with, um, with this team, we have we, we launched our effort. And the other reasons we selected this case, just to tell you briefly, because there were a lot of possible cases, um, the fact that it happened in 1965, and I'll tell you what the case is in a minute, was very important. It wasn't that long ago. There are many, many living witnesses to the incident. It's a very clear-cut black and white issue, because the Air Force has said nothing came down. And the people say, we saw it. It did come down. So that makes it, the contradiction is very clear there between the government and what the people say. And it involves the collection of an object, so that involves the possible, possibility of there being physical evidence, which we found to be important. Um, in the fall of October 2002, we just, this is an example, we've done two press conferences in Washington. This was the press release for the first one um, in which we launched this, this Freedom of Information Act effort. And um, what's, what was very important for us was John Podesta, came out in support of our work. And he spoke at the first press conference. He spoke at the second one. I'm going to show you a clip of him in a little while. He, is, he was President Clinton's uh, chief of staff. And he's very interested in freedom of information. And he's very interested in the UFO issue. So um, we've been very fortunate to have him as part of our team. And this is the, one of the articles. Me much media coverage has occurred whenever we do a press conference. And part of that is because we have John Podesta with us. 
This is a CNN story that came out after the first press release, in which the focus was, of course, that the Clinton aide is coming out and um, protesting the government secrecy on this. Um, the, just to give you a little background on the, the, I don't know if you can even see this, but um, there we go. This is just to show you the trajectory. What happened in 1965 was there was a fireball that was seen over about four states, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, came down, went through Pennsylvania, landed in this tiny little hamlet called Kecksburg. Where is that near? It's near, it's about 40 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, 40 to 60 miles. Um, it's basically middle of nowhere. And it, I want, just want you to notice here that the object made some turns, and that's very important. And, and Stan Gordon was able to track the trajectory by talking to hundreds of witnesses along various the routes of the object. Um, it was it basically came down in, in, um, in a little field of in woods actually near Kecksburg on a farmer's land. Um, the media, the military was called out within a couple of hours. Uh, a number of people saw it. And people saw it in all different stages. Some saw it in the air. Some saw it out right after it landed. There was smoke coming out of the woods. Uh, the mil you know, some people got down and actually saw it on the ground. Uh, the military was called in. They cordoned off the area, took the object out on the bed of a, on the back of a truck, and um, that's all I really you know. That's it in a nutshell. This is the um, some of the headlines that came out. Um, it was first, it was called the UFO. This was before they actually knew what had happened. This came out that night or first thing in the morning the next day. Army ropes off area. The media, they reported on the fact that all the military were there. Um, this is another one written by the same reporter, Robert Gaddy, who was on the scene, who I've been able to interview. We've had extensive conversations about his experience covering this. So after we have these first two stories, the next one that came out later that day was searchers fail to find object. And um, flying object plus search equals zero. So basically what happened, the only, the only documentation we have on the Kecksburg case is in Project Blue Book. And Project Blue Book stated that nothing was found that night, that a three-man team was sent out to search for an object that started a fire, and they didn't find anything. Uh, this is a, a picture of what of one person's rent. It's not the most accurate, but the object did land in a gully, and it looked more, a little more like an acorn in that the bottom had more of a rim around it than this drawing shows you. Here's another drawing by a witness. This is an affidavit that he made for one of our FOIA requests to the Army. It's a description of what it looked like on the back of a truck. Um, there were probably hundreds of people that actually saw the military presence. And you know, and as there were so many witnesses, I mean, dozens and dozens of witnesses that have accurate and important stories to tell. And when you interview them all separately, it all fits together into a nice puzzle, and it all makes sense about what happened. And as a journalist, I've spent time. I've been there many times. I've interviewed these people myself. It is inconceivable to me that nothing came down that night. It's just uh, given what all the testimony that we have and the work that Stan has done over all these years. Um, so we came in on this case, as I mentioned, and we began to file Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, and I'm going to give you a little, a little report on some of the things we found a little bit. But I also wanted to commend the Sci-Fi Channel for taking this on and for providing the necessary resources for such a, a team to be constructed. Um, and it's a sad statement that you have to file, you have to have a law firm to get through, get anywhere with Freedom of Information Act. But unfortunately, that seems to be the case. Um, the Sci-Fi Channel produced a documentary about this, the work that we've been doing, which was aired last fall, and I'm sure some of you saw that. And I want to just, uh, Eric, show you a couple of clips from that so that you don't have to listen to me talk forever. One of the important things that came out of the work that the Sci-Fi Channel did was they sent some scientists onto the site where the object came down. And um, we're clear about where that is because some, there were a number of witnesses who independently took Stan Gordon down to the site when he first, this was back in the late 80s, early 90s. People who had never met each other, never spoken to each other, they took him to the same place, they described the object the same way. And um, so we know where, where it was. And um, I just wanted to show you one aspect of this investigation, there's just a lot that I could talk about, was, was this, we brought the Sci-Fi Channel brought some scientists down to the site to see if they could discover anything that would prove that something came down that day. And so I'll, we'll run the first clip, and you'll see what happened. of West Virginia University, Combs the Woods, 
looking for clues that might shed some light on what happened here in December of 1965. It's not on the screen, the video. Hicks has spent the last two days searching for a pattern of broken trees. I've got some red flagging going into the woods here that um, indicates the, the pathway, I suppose, that uh, the, the object apparently came from was presumably so somewhere up through here. If we look up into the top of this, uh, this tree right here, you can see that it does look like it may have been broken out. Dr. Hicks takes a core sample from a damaged tree pointed out by eyewitness John Hayes. Right underneath that fence, it's like right the rings in the core will not only tell him the age of the tree, but also when the damage to it may have occurred. And now what I am seeing here is that right in this zone, beginning right here, in fact, there's a very distinct change in the growth rings. This ash falls right in the center in the path of damaged trees. We've counted from the bark of the tree back to this point where we found this dramatic slowdown in growth. And what we found was that there were 38 rings back to that point. That would indicate that whatever happened to slow that tree down happened about 1965. 1965, the same year as the Kecksburg incident, and at the very least, strong circumstantial evidence backing up eyewitness reports that an object did crash through these trees. The damage that Ray identified formed a pattern. It formed a clear trajectory. It is a reasonable trajectory from some of the other observations that were made. And the real nice thing about it, it has a date to it, 1965. And since there is obvious visible damage, that is a smoking gun, so to speak, as to what caused the decrease in growth on that individual tree. Dr. Hicks' discovery is a tremendous step towards proving that an object did indeed land in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania in December of 1965. So that's a very significant development. This is brand new, actually, last spring, that there's been proof that something did come down and it came down in 1965. Um, it's almost proof of the event, as far as I'm concerned. But again, the Air Force still claims that nothing came down. And none of the other agencies that we've, we've contacted, all of them, have released any information about this event at all. Um, so uh, just to give you a little bit more of an update as to where we are with the investigation, um, I also wanted to tell you that one of the, and this was another interesting development that happened, uh, and I'm going I'm to deal with the freedom of information stuff s soon, but that's, I want to give you some of the other investigations we've been doing around this case. The Cosmos 96 question, many people have thought for a long time that what came down in Pennsylvania was part of a Venera probe that was sent out by the Soviet Union called Cosmos 96. And this, this, um, there were problems with this probe, and it crashed in Canada, actually, on the morning of the same day, early in the morning, 318, of the same day that the Pennsylvania event took place, which was, again, at 5 in the afternoon. Um, people have speculated that, oh, it was part of Cosmos 96. Here's a picture, uh, back to the slides, um, of, I guess I forgot to tell you about the town hall, but we're going to, we'll go back to that in a bit. But this is um, what part of this, this isn't exactly Cosmos 96, but it's what it would have looked like because it's a, in a, a, one of the other series that was right near that time. And some people have claimed that this is, this is actually what it was. Well, I already knew that it was. I was pretty convinced it wasn't because of the size. You know, the, the, this object is um, much smaller. It's only three feet. It's much smaller than the object. By the way, I didn't tell you that the object that came down was between, around 12 to 15 feet. Uh, the witnesses said that it looked like a human being could stand up inside. It was about the size of a Volkswagen bus. It also made controlled turns. It seemed to land at an angle as if it was an airplane approaching an airport. It didn't just come crashing down straight from the sky. For all those reasons, it was unlikely to have been Cosmos 96, but the debunkers like to say that that's what it was. Well, I was able to contact an important scientist from NASA, probably the leading expert in the world on this issue, and he was a, his name's Nicholas Johnson. He's the chief scientist for orbital debris at the NASA Johnson Space Center. He was able to obtain the coordinates of Cosmos 96 so that he could calculate if part of it had kept stayed in orbit after the crash that happened that morning, could it have landed in Pennsylvania? 
And he was able to determine absolutely not, made the statement for us that it is impossible that that could have been Cosmos 96. And the more interesting statement he made was that, in fact, there, there is no man-made object that came down over Pennsylvania on, at 5 o'clock on that day. There's no man-made object. That, and he said that he has the databases and the knowledge to determine, even if it had been a, some kind of secret experiment, he would be aware of it. He was also able to eliminate the Project Corona, which was a project that was dropping uh, these, these, these um, canisters. It was sending out these spy satellites to Russia, photographing things from the sky, flying back over the United States and dropping canisters, which were then retrieved. Some people have thought that that might have been what it was. He was also able to eliminate that. This is a, um, what he sent me, which was a, just a trajectory of, of um, the object that particular day. And it could have passed over Pennsylvania, but it would have been at 5.30 in the morning. So I was very excited that, that as far as I'm concerned, we've ruled out the leading contender for an explanation of what came down in Pennsylvania, a number of leading contenders. It makes the, the search a lot more interesting because uh, we're eliminating other, you know, other possibilities. Um, another thing I was able to do was to contact and interview a number of the Air Force personnel who searched for the object that night. That was another new development. And, um, these, and again, I don't have the time to go into detail, but um, they, were, they all said that nothing was found. There were many contradictions in their stories between different people, um, which made me wonder really what was going on. And the other interesting thing was that the one person who was actually out on the team searching, he said that, that he saw absolutely no military presence. There were huge spotlights shining down on the area where the object was. He saw no spotlights. There were cars jamming the roads, police roadblocks all over the place in the area. It was a, a madhouse. He saw none of that. He said there was no activity. There were no military there. There were no police roadblocks. There were no spotlights. There were no civilians you know, crowding the roads. There were hundreds of people out of their cars looking down into this gully that night. So the fact that he didn't see any of that makes me wonder if maybe they took him to the wrong place. <laughs> he either searched the wrong place or he doesn't want to disclose what he knows. I, I can't think of any other explanation. He just said, well, yeah, we went out with our flashlights, looked around, we didn't find anything, saw no activity at all. So um, I find that very intriguing that, you know, there's such a, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so this information that I'm relaying to you now about the trees and this, these Air Force personnel, all that was released at another press conference which we just held last fall in which we also announced that we are filing a lawsuit um, against NASA. NASA is one of the agencies that we've been working on getting information from. A number of witnesses have reported that they saw NASA personnel on the scene. And we have other reasons to believe that NASA, so NASA was very active at that time in collecting debris that fell from space. And they had programs which were involved with just that. And we have every reason to believe that they were, they should know something, they certainly should have some information about it. Um, and I want to just show you the second videotape now. This is also part of the Sci-Fi Channel documentary. It just gives you a little taste of what my organization, the Coalition for Freedom of Information, has been doing in Washington and, and in trying to access information from the government about Kecksburg. So we can run the second clip. It was in the early 90s. Kane and the Sci-Fi Channel have enlisted the help of DC-based attorney Lee Halfrick to force the records to open using the legal system. There is just no dispute that whatever you call it, the UFO phenomenon was an event or is an event that happens periodically and regularly uh, in this country. And how the government reacted to that event is useful information because it will help explain why the government reacts to other kinds of similar events. It may not have been an alien spacecraft. It could have been a Soviet spy satellite. It could have been uh, one of our own space experiments. It could have been any one of those things. At this point, 40 years later, we deserve to know what it is. The coalition has gained another powerful ally in its search for the truth. President Clinton's former chief of staff, John Podesta. It's time to find out what, what the truth really is that's out there. Well, I've spent a career trying to defend the public's right to know. The records of the Klecksburg uh, investigation uh, should be released. 25 years uh, of holding them secret was long enough. 
certainly having the military descend on a United States town holding people at gunpoint is not the ordinary way we do business in this country. People should have an explanation about what triggered that sort of military response so that people can judge for themselves whether it was appropriate. On October 21st, 2003, the Coalition for Freedom of Information held a press conference in Washington, D.C. John Podesta wasted no time in assessing CFI's investigation of the Kecksburg case. And I'm here today because we haven't made any progress. As I said a year ago, when this Freedom of Information quest began, the American public can handle the truth. The most frustrating for me in the FOIA request so far has been the Army, actually. I was just really shocked when I saw the response they made to our request because we provided them with extensive documentation as to the fact that there was an Army presence that night. It was without question the Army was there. For them to come back and say, we, your request isn't specific enough, we can't help you, we don't know where to look for this information, uh, how much more specific can you get than giving the exact date, time, and location of the event during the press conference, attorney Lee Helfrick of Lobel, Novins, and Lamont spoke of just how difficult it is to get information from the government. One of the things that we expected was the uh, no records response, which is, I think, uh, number 10 in the list of 329 ways the government can refuse your FOIA request. Acting on the Coalition for Freedom of Information's behalf, Helfrick appealed Ness's no records response and won. NASA doesn't provide the records requested, a lawsuit will be filed against them. News of the lawsuit made newspapers and websites across the country. Even some all news networks carried the story. You know, stories in small towns often tend to take on a life of their own. Well, now the Sci-Fi Channel is trying to get to the bottom of it all, going so far as to join a lawsuit against the government to reveal what it knows. Within hours of the press conference, NASA dropped a bombshell. The agency was releasing 36 pages of documents to the public. After 38 years, the long wait was over. Lo and behold, that very day, our attorney got a call from NASA saying, oh, we've put some documents in the mail to you today. So everybody was fascinated and excited. Oh, what are they going to be? Are these going to be significant? Among the many items Leslie Kane had asked for were the Fragology Files, a catalog of objects that had fallen from space during the 1960s. We were given a list of what some of these files were dating in the, in the 1960s, that they did exist. We very much want to get access to the Frigology files because we believe they could have something to do with the Kecksburg case. We've been told by NASA, though, that these files have been missing since 1987. The fact that the documents were supposedly missing in 1987, but then there was a notation later that said at 94 they were at the Federal Records Center certainly raises a red flag. We want to keep pursuing NASA to find those files for us. There's references to Project Moondust in connection with these files. One of the mandates of Project Moondust was to search for UFOs. So it's a bit of a long shot, but whenever you see something as suggestive as this, of course, uh, we want to see what's in them. In the end, the majority of the 36 pages of documents proved to be a major disappointment. They sent to us documents that we had already sent to them, sent them back, and in addition to that, just a bunch of, of articles that one could access through a research library, and that was it. Hopefully we'll look at more documents, we'll look at those. CFI is doing its own investigation, and so, you know, everything is a clue. It's like being a cop. It's solving that mystery. We would like to be able to put this one to rest. And that's our goal. There was one key name on the files that immediately grabbed Kane's attention. This individual named Richard Schulher is, is an individual we've been trying to get information about who worked for NASA and we think may have been involved with the Kecksburg incident. And they said they could not confirm or deny whether they had any records on him at all. That was really the most interesting aspect of the NASA response, that they made reference to him and indicated that there was some sensitivity as to his records at NASA. Okay, we can stop, the, stop it there. Um, could you just go to the third videotape now and skip the second one? I just want to show you, we don't have, I was going to show you more of Podesta, but we don't have time to do that. Um, I just want to show you this one little clip that to show you the importance of John Podesta, and it's just kind of a funny thing to watch, it's about 30 seconds, that was done an inside edition um, about him and his interest in the work that we're doing. If you could run that third video. Okay. 
and it's coming. I mean, it, it was, yeah, no, it was, it was queued up. There's just a little static where it, when the beginning before it actually starts playing. But um, anyway, while they're getting it set up, um, uh, I just want to let you know that the agencies we're focusing on are the Army, NASA, and the Air Force. They're the ones that seem to have the most likely to have information about this. Um, and. The, the efforts with NASA began in January of 2003, and I've, there's many steps that we had to take. You have to exhaust a lot of steps before you can actually file a lawsuit. But we won our, we, they gave us a no records response, we appealed that, and we won it. And that's very, it's actually very difficult to win an appeal on a no records response, so we were very happy about that. All the things they promised us, though, when we won the appeal, which was that, that for instance, that the, the request would be expedited, that there would be a new search done on the frogology files, that uh, all the NASA centers would be contacted, et cetera. They would all do searches for us. Um, never took place. They basically made a bunch of promises. And we waited. That was in June. We waited until October of last fall. They had done absolutely nothing. And it was at that point that we threatened the lawsuit. We had no choice. We filed the lawsuit on December 9th, which was, the, I think, the 35th anniversary of the Kecksburg incident. It's now in the courts. Um, and NASA is, has granted, has given documents to the courts stating that they have done a thorough search. We absolutely believe that's not the case. And just Friday, uh, we filed, this is a 60-page um, opposition to NASA's motion for summary judgment, which our lawyer put together. It just went into court on Friday. Um, and it's basically stating, you know, in intense detail, all the reasons showing how NASA has broken the law over and over again. And by you know, denying us documents and operating in bad faith. I just wanted to read you one little quote that she wrote on the, our lawyer Lee Helfrick wrote on the first page of this. NASA seeks summary judgment based upon bold assertions by FOIA officers that unidentified employees of sometimes unidentified offices made thorough searches of unidentified record systems under unidentified search methodologies and found essentially nothing. Apparently this approach is normal policy for NASA for NASA center-wide FOIA searches, accepting NASA's claims in this case that its search was, in essence, good enough for government work, unquote, would be the equivalent of declaring the FOIA a dead letter. Going through the motions is not the equivalent of complying with the FOIA. October 21st, 2003. The is exactly what the record demonstrates NASA did three times in response to our requests, et cetera. It is an absolutely incredible document. I'm really impressed with our attorney. She's done a brilliant work on this. And, um, you know, she outlines, and I'd be happy to let anybody look at this afterwards, um, just to read you briefly the four points that summarize it. NASA's declarations and attachments fail to set forth the details of any reasonably calculated search and review of documents responsive to Ms. Kane's Freedom of Information Act request. NASA has failed to release all responsive documents that it has identified. Three, NASA failed to conduct a reasonably calculated search. Um, and there's a fourth point here. Um, Four, NASA's searches for documents were conducted in bad faith. And fifth, five, NASA's index fails to provide a clear explanation on why documents were withheld. All of these things are very complicated and require a lot of legal explanation of what took place in this report. So we only have about Putting five more minutes, so I map, just want to see if there's the any Bush questions. If, you, if that video's up there, plan. can you run it? It's but only 30 will it seconds. change the landscape in the Middle East? If it's not, we'll forget it. That's the turkey. Okay, I'm going to open it up to questions, side. and then if you get Just it up the there, we'll, we'll no, that's not it. I don't know what that is. Around, <laughs> it was a political disaster. I, somebody I'd rather not have to look so at right now. So what makes some 2004 but, um, Democrats think they can so bring So does new anybody have any comments or questions? Um, because we only have five more minutes. Summarily, all I know that there was two or three people. 
people that were in the party, but the chief and several of the people that were in there totally denied that there was ever anybody even present in the town, much less the That's true. army and uh, everybody else. So, uh, Mike, I guess obviously the, the question would be, uh, what do you think happened? And do you think there was pressure put on these individuals? And what about that? Yeah, I mean, it's possible that pressure was put on, but just to clarify what you're saying, the, what you're saying is accurate, but it's not true that no firemen, there was that no firemen actually said that something did happen. I mean, there's, the, there were the chief of the fire department, the one who claims nothing happened, actually wasn't on duty that night. He was at work. And there was another guy who was second in command that was on duty who, who says that something did happen. It's very complicated. And one of the uh, very first witnesses that took Stan Gordon to the site and actually showed him exactly where it was and described the object, who, someone who had gotten very close to it, was a firefighter. The firefighters were the first on the scene. And so most of them, the, Stan has not been able to locate, unfortunately. You know, they wouldn't, there aren't, the, the, and the other interesting thing is though, the records from the fire department are missing. There should have been records on what, who went out that night and what happened that night. And, and there were people that have looked for those within the department and were not able to find them. You know, it's an interesting point. There are some people in the village that say nothing happened. There aren't many. There's probably a handful, six people or half a dozen people. And, you know, dozens and dozens who say that something did happen. So there's a lot of contention about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll take another question. Maybe we'll run it. Go ahead. Go on the mic. People can't hear you. Uh, do you have a definite identification on the military people that there were army as opposed to National Guard? There could have been National Guard. We've looked into that too. I mean, that's there could have been National Guard. We believe there, there very easily could have been National Guard. We're convinced about the army because a number of people saw army insignia. They saw the jeeps that have the army symbols on them and um, a reporter who did it, John, by the name of John Murphy, that's a whole other story we didn't get into, right. um, did an extensive radio documentary, and he reported actually going to the Army barracks and seeing the Army there. So, I mean, I'm, I'm convinced the Army was there. The National Guard, we're not as sure about, but we have done extensive increase. We've done FOIA requests on National Guard, haven't been able to find anything. We've located, you know, we're trying to go back to some of the old headquarters of the National Guard. And the search, and we're still working on it, but so far we, we really can't say for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Just a point of information, uh, when I came in here Thursday night, one of the things I was told right away is that NBC has purchased the Sci-Fi Channel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if that's the case, Sci-Fi, the personality of that station will probably change. Second thing is, uh, the video that you're talking about, Kecksburg, I think ran at 7 o'clock Denver time this past Wednesday night on the History Channel. Well, you, I, I don't think so, because stuff, it ran on sci-fi this week, though. They repeated it. Okay. So that's probably what you're thinking of. There's another documentary on, that I was oh, on that okay. was on History Channel, but I, wasn't, I don't think I was talking about Kecksburg on that one. But I, I know it wasn't run anywhere else but sci-fi, though. It, on sci-fi sci this, this week? Yeah, they just reran it this week, actually. Okay. The History Channel is picking up a lot of old TV documentaries from other networks. So I, just if you're not aware of that, watch their schedule. You get to see some stuff. The satellite, the Russian satellite 69? Cosmos 96, yeah. Cosmos 96, 96. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm dyslexic. <laughs> um, because of the close proximity, isn't it possible that perhaps that coming down at that time might have been the reason for the UFO crash? Um, you mean the fact that it came down early in the morning on that day? Well, well we, what we know is we got a letter from NORAD that states it came down at 3.18 a.m. in Canada. 3.18. A.m., The, other, the yeah. UFO crash came down at 5? At 5 p.m. Yeah. It just happened to be the same day. Okay. So, and this Nicholas Johnson, who's the leading expert in the world on Soviet space systems, said, I mean, and I'm talking another expert in England who's also number two in, in the world. I mean, he, he said it was impossible for it to have been Cosmos 96. You know, I'm, my job is to report the information that I get. I mean, I... You know, some people might want to say, oh, he's part of NASA, he could be lying. Um, I, you know, I'm not operating on that assumption, but, you know, people can draw their own conclusions. So I personally don't think they were related because of what he said. 
So they were two hours apart. They were like, one was three o'clock in the morning, and the actual, that was Cosmos, and then the incident in Kecksburg was 5 p.m. So they were, you know, many, many hours apart. Any more questions? I don't know. Okay. Um, I think it's called Kexper. Oh, there were two of them. That's the thing. They did the first one was um, something like the uh, Kexberg, uh, the new, the, the new Roswell or something. The second one I think was something like a new evidence or because the second one was. I don't know. I can look that up for you. Um, it it also to the prime minister, so there were a lot of connections to the government. In any case, what was extraordinary about the study was that these individuals spent uh, three years studying only official documentation from around the world on the UFO subject, and um, they they drew a very extraordinary conclusion uh, in the end of the study. You can see it up here on the uh, the part that's highlighted. Um, they basically stated that the best uh, conclusion to explain UFOs was the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And as I said, this was based on a lot of study of a lot of documentation of interviews with pilots, of studying radar, radar visual cases, speaking with governments around the world. Um, and they did realize that 5% of sightings are really the only valid ones. Most sightings can be dismissed. But they were focusing their study only on those in which there was enough documentation to determine that they were not something uh, man-made. And they described this, this 5% of objects. They said that they seem to be completely unknown flying machines with exceptional performances that are guided by a natural or artificial intelligence. And you know, we may have all heard things like this before, but what was significant about this was the caliber of the people that wrote this and the numbers of people that wrote this. And as a journalist, you can't turn away from uh, that quality of, of um, you know, instigator. Of the, the, when you consider who wrote this report, it is a journalist's responsibility to take it seriously. And um, I did that. And I believed it was newsworthy that people of that stature would come forward and draw a conclusion like this and make that publicly available. Um, the other thing that was really interesting about this report was that they called for international action and asked the European Union to get involved in uh, addressing this issue, and particularly Adir, but um, it was a breakthrough for me to get it published. I was very, very um, inspired to do it. I felt it was really important, and um, I was just fanatical about getting it published and very happy that it, it worked out. Um, and I'm gonna, in a minute, we're going to talk a little more about the ridicule factor, but I wanted to just uh, share with you another story I did a year later. The Globe story came out in 2000, and this is a second story that came out in 2001, which originally appeared in the Providence Journal, which is the paper of Providence, Rhode Island. It went out on the wire service and was released all over the place, including Canada. And this dealt with um, the issue of aviation safety as it relates to UFOs. And this is the kind of information that a journalist can work with. You have to have something. This was, this was based on a report by Richard Haynes, who I know many of you are familiar with. Um, and he's an aerospace scientist from NASA Ames. He'd been there for years. Um, had been collecting case reports from pilots, only from pilots for about 30 years. He released a study in which he analyzed those cases in which aviation safety was affected and documented about 100 cases in which aviation safety was affected. In other words, pilots had to make sudden maneuvers to avoid collisions. Planes were pulled off course by, by the objects. Um, in, you know, the instruments were affected. Compasses went crazy. People were, the, the crew was distracted by things going on outside the window. And he believed that this was of serious concern and the aviation community should take it seriously. And that's the kind of, kind of sort of official document that allowed me to do another story and to branch off into other aspects of the question of, of pilots as, as they report UFOs. Um, and I just. Hello, it's great to be here. It takes some getting used to not being able to see anybody, but um, I wanted to thank John Schusler and everybody from MUFON for putting on this great conference and for inviting me to speak at it. 
Um, I just wanted to tell you, first of all, that um, I'm going to cover two things in, this, in the brief time that we have, so I'm going to go fairly quickly through a lot of material, and then I want to have time for questions at the end. Um, the first part is I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on my, my journey as a journalist publishing on UFOs. And then we're going to talk about the work with the Coalition for Freedom of Information that I've been doing and the Kecksburg, the effort to obtain documentation on Kecksburg, which has resulted in a lawsuit against NASA. And so I want to just start by telling you that I'm not a UFO researcher. I am a journalist, and they're very different. Um, I've been you know, able to benefit tremendously, of course, from the researchers. And all the people that are here today have been of great help to me in doing the job that I have to do as a journalist which is primarily to get the information out in the press, to make the information available to people that have a right to it. And, to, and my personal mission has been to try to get through the ridicule barrier that we all are so familiar with. Another goal, which a lot of journalists have, um, myself included, is to try to change policy through articles. And I've done that for years on various other issues. I, I, I worked for many years on the issue of human rights in the country of Burma. I was sort of a specialist in Burma. I wrote a book on it, published articles, which did lead to you know, hearings and, and changes in policy. And that's always a goal. Um, to let you know that my background involves uh, uh, publishing freelance articles in lots of mainstream media and also working for a public radio station in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, KPFA Radio, where I co-hosted and co-produced a daily investigative news show for many years. Um, so um, you might want to know why would somebody like that get interested in UFOs? And um, I'll start by telling you that, and we'll, we'll go to the first slide. Um, back in the summer of 1999, um, a report was sent to me by a colleague in France, France called the Cometa Report. Many of you may be familiar with that. Um, but this was a, an extraordinary 90-page study that was put together by a group of generals and admirals, uh, the equivalent of the head of NASA in France, uh, the, the chief of police in France, um, uh, scientists, weapons engineers. Um, it was extremely high level because it, it involved a people of very high stature in France, although it was not a government document. It was a white paper, as they call it. But um, on, in the slide, you can see the... Um, the four-star general, General, Nor yeah, general Norlane is the, the one on the top, who's the four-star general, who's one of the motivating forces behind the study. On the bottom is General Letty, who's an Air Force pilot, very well known in France. And General Norlane is a um, counselor addressed the issue of, of US secrecy, which they consider to be a major problem. Um, so I wrote a story about this for the Boston Globe. And it's a long, I don't have the time to tell you the saga that I went through in trying to get this story published. But I did appeal to about a dozen uh, papers. I mean, I appealed to more, but many of them were ones that I had published in before, papers who respected my work and usually you know, ran the, the story. It took, the only reason I was able to get it into the Boston Globe was because I had worked with the editor there on about five other stories in the past, and she happened to be very open-minded. Um, and like my work, but it, it was really touch and go. And the only reason for that was because of the subject matter. It didn't matter who the voices were behind the report. It didn't matter that, that I, I applied the same standards of journalism to this article that I've applied to everything else that I've published. It, what mattered was that it dealt with this taboo subject. And I was able to learn through direct experience just how serious the problem uh, is of ridicule. Um, because most of the publications would not even look at the story. And some of them hung up on me. And I tried to even avoid using the word UFO, even though the title of the report was UFOs and Defense. What are we prepared for? And just as an aside, the report is very focused on the national security implications of UFOs, because it's basically a military document. But nonetheless, none of that really mattered. Um, but I, I was very, you know, I didn't even know until two days before this came out whether it would come out at all. And it took three months for me to uh, back and forth with the editor, and twice in which she said, forget it, I can't handle this, it's too sensitive, I'm not going to do it. And it, it was a long process, and I can answer any questions about it later.